You know it's late night, spoiler time. You know it's late night, spoiler time. What time is it? Late night, spoiler time. It says late night, spoiler time with your boy Dev. From SBMTG, we like it a magic, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Dev, we just had a spoiler season. We had a whole Phyrexia set came out. Is that, is that right, or was that some kind of dream? No, that actually did happen. You're right. It, these are already new spoilers two weeks after a set just came out but don't worry it's not spoiler season if that makes you feel any better this is just our first look at march of the machines the next standard set that's coming out in like a couple of months but with sometimes they like to show us cards early and i'm okay with that but we're not here to litigate the whole like when is spoiler season over we're, not, we're here to look at amazing new cards and we, we got those we got like 15 cards to look at from the set and they're all ridiculously hype and i want to get to them let's talk about it let's talk about the new cards they're good i'll start things off today with three cards that i'm going to call like normal cards i mean these are really good looking cards i think that at least one of these is like one of the best cards we'll actually see like all day but these are cards that are less likely to make you just lose your mind as soon as you see the card image and go like completely Waffle House and just tear the place apart. So I think it's important to build tension to not show you the really fan servicey stuff first. A bit of foreshadowing there, but let's take a look at Moment of Truth for our first card today. This thing looks innocuous, but it's actually a banger of a card. This is two mana, one and a blue for an instant. Look at the top three cards of your library. Put one of those cards into your hand, one into your graveyard, and the other on the bottom of your library. So in Anticipate and strategic planning finally how little baby and it's a good card too. This is instant speed and in some decks This is effectively just gonna say draw two cards just great for reanimator decks mid-range control decks that play out of their graveyard a little bit The occasional combo deck just goes in everything just like your mom. It's a great filtration tool So I expect this thing to show up every now and again. This is a nice little magic card here plus Get a little Elspeth reference. Card really just has it all. And on top of all that, card's got a great name. It's going to be great for memes during streams, you know? Eminem riff starts playing. You only get one shot, mom spaghetti and all that stuff. Just, it's going to lead to some good times. So, just a sweet all-around card here, and I can't wait to play it. But up next is Breach the Multiverse. This is seven mana. That's a lot of mana. Five and two black for a sorcery. Each player mills ten cards. For each player, choose a creature or planeswalker card in that player's graveyard. Put those cards onto the battlefield under your control. Then, each creature you control becomes a Phyrexian in addition to its other types. I also just love when they add a pretty unnecessary line of text to the end of a card, so you have to just keep reading it. Been reading it for a minute, and still reading this card. Oh, what's this last thing it does? Nothing? All right. So, of course, now that I say that, that's probably going to be like the most important card for some like niche tech reason, but still. The most important part about the card, the actual thing the card does, is it gives you two things. I know that some people are going to just want to mill your opponent out with this, and you actually might be able to do that, some sort of Demir control deck with the new Jace, right? And this could be like a win condition two ways. You could mill them out. I'm talking myself into it. I am one of the people. <laughs> you could, I guess you could like hit them with Jace minus five and then immediately hit them with this. And maybe that does the trick, but in case it doesn't, you can just put like two of the best things from either of your decks into play. Uh, probably another Jace. <laughs> or just do that and then finish them that way. This deck's gonna work, isn't it? Extra bonus points if you hit your own Jace and your opponent's Jace. GG's. But this is just cool. This is a sweet card, but seven mana is like so much, dude. <laughs> seven mana is a lot for this effect, uh, which does not necessarily say you win the game. If you're gonna pay seven mana for a card, it usually just has that text written on it somehow or another, and I don't really see that with this, but it could. Could you pay seven mana for this and get like a planeswalker and a big fat man out of the graveyard? Then you probably probably doing okay at least. End of the day though, I'm just not really sold on this being like a huge mid-range finishing option a la emergent ultimatum or something like that. It's just not quite on that level, so I'm just not too sure about it, but imagine getting it stuck up under an arcane bombardment or something. We can do some janky things with it, but I'm just not sure that it's quite where it needs to be in terms of power level. You probably use them slots better is all I'm saying, friend. But the last uh, air quotes, normal, un-air quotes card of the day that we'll look at is uh, one of the best cards of the day, period. It's very mastermind. This thing looks like a beast. Two mana, one and a blue for a 2-1 fairy rogue with flash and flying, and whenever an opponent draws their second card each turn, you get to draw a card, and you can also pay three and a blue to have each player draw a card. This was designed by Yuta Takahashi, the world champion, 27. Now in standard, this is probably going to proc off a lot of Reckoner Bankbuster activations. Hold on, let me get down there with you guys. It's probably going to feel a little better. Yeah, that's all right. But anyway, yeah, it's probably going to proc off a lot of Reckoner Bankbuster uh, stuff. So there's that. There's also plenty of other ways that people draw cards in standard right now. So I could see this being 
very much real. Like, do you play it instead of Fairy Vandal? Do you play it instead of Spectral Adversary? In standard, I'm not too sure. In other formats where people are slinging spells and drawing cards a little bit more often on a more reliable basis, maybe, then I could see, I could see how this could see even more play be an even more powerful card. I could see it reading a little bit busted to some, and I could even see it reading like not that great to others. But in the in the reality, it's fine. It's just a fine, fair magic card that I think is going to do a little bit of work in multiple formats, but not be like this like amazing world ending we need to talk about this card. I don't think it's just going to do some quiet work and be a nice guy. So I like I like cards like that. You know, it seems like impactful, but fair. And that's a good place to be. But now let's get into that fan service, I promise. Starting with Heliod, the Radiant Dawn. This is four mana, two and two white for a 4-4 four, four legendary enchantment creature god. And when it enters the battlefield, return an enchantment card that isn't a god from your graveyard to your hand. You can pay three and a blue Phyrexian mana to transform Heliod. You can only activate this as a sorcery, by the way. Now it transforms into Heliod, the Warped Eclipse. This is a 4-6 legendary enchantment creature Phyrexian god. You may cast spells as though they had flash. Spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card your opponents have drawn this turn. Yeah, it's Heliod, um, and he's Phyrexianized. Phyrexiafied? Not really sure, but I'll give you a moment to deal with the emotional impact of that if you need it. And in case you didn't know, that's what March of the Machines is about. It's just the Phyrexians going to like every plane, like every single plane, and just steamrolling every single one of them. And that's a thing to do with your story, I guess. You know, I don't know how you get out of that. Time travel? Magic button? I'm sure it's fantasy. You can do whatever you want, but that's a video for another time. And perhaps another channel. Uh, we're here to talk about whether or not the card is good. And I know that a lot of people have been freaking out about a lot of these cards all day, but this is one of those I'm just not like super sold on. Now, there's a lot of positives, obviously. Like just on the baseline, this is a four mana four four that draws you a card in like huge air quotes. We used to, us old heads call that replacing itself when it comes into play. But you have to play enchantments, non god enchantments, so it can't get back a Heliod. Stop scheming over there i see you and so does wizards but anyway you have to play like non-god enchantments and stuff in your deck in order to really make this give you the real value so you have to tailor your deck around it that's a real consideration when brewing aside from that it is four mana and it costs an additional at least three mana at sorcery speed so that's seven mana in installments it takes both your turn four and pretty much your entire turn five to do that which isn't a lot. I mean, I guess you could have two mana up theoretically on turn five, and that's enough for a negate or a removal spell, and those are good things. But it takes the majority of your turn five to flip this over. When you do have it flipped over, it does really cool stuff. Again, like mass, massive positives here. I love that it's just spells. It's just spells, not not instant or sorcery spells, artifact spells, blah, blah. You can cast this or planeswalker spells as though they had flash. No, just spells. You can cast spells as though they had flash. And spells you cast cost one less to cast for all the cards they've drawn this turn. And that, that is really very good, I think. So if you can get it flipped over, then it sits there. And does cool stuff in your control deck. And that same control deck can use, you know, the first half of it, the two and you know, two white half, to get back an ossification or a wedding announcement that's in their graveyard. So there are good things. This card does a lot of positives, but I do think that spending that much mana at sorcery speed is going to be a little awkward. But tap out control is somewhat popular in this day and age, what with Esper Super Friends and stuff. So I could see I could see this card seeing some play. I'm not saying it's just flat out bad, but it is a lot of mana and a little bit of tailoring your deck around in order to play it. But once it's flipped over, you know, it doesn't really care what kind of spells are in your deck. You can just cast whatever spells you want at, at instant speed. And that's awesome. <laughs> These are really, really cool abilities. So I like the card. I just think that in terms of like actual relevance and standard, the ability to see real standard play, it's more like a B minus, but that's still fairly strong. But let's move on to another legendary creature, actually, about which I have very similar feelings to the feelings I have about Heliod, right? A lot of people are just losing their minds. They're going guano about this card all day today saying like, oh my God, this card's insane. What are we going to do? And I'm going to take a step back and say that just like Heliod, again, I think this is a good card that could see some play, but I don't think it's actually that broken. Let's take a look at Jenga Taxis here. This version of Jenga Taxis is five mana, three and two blue for a five, five legendary Phyrexian Praetor with Ward two. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell with mana value three or greater, draw a card. You can pay three blue 
exile Jenga Taxis, then return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. Activate only as a sorcery, and only if you have seven or more cards in your hand. It transforms into a saga, the Great Synthesis. On chapter one, draw cards equal to the number of cards in your hand. You have no maximum hand size for as long as you control the Great Synthesis. You can also, on chapter two, return all non-Phyrexian creatures to their owner's hands, and on chapter three, you may cast any number of spells from your hand without paying their mana costs. Exile the Great Synthesis, then return it to the battlefield front face up. So that is a great deal of text. And yes, once you transform him, he'll have at least 14 cards in your hand and no maximum hand size. These are good things. But again, a little similar to my complaints with Heliod, this thing costs nine mana this time. Again, all at sorcery speed. In installments, it takes you turn five and then it takes you turn six and you're not protecting yourself in any real way while you're doing that, right? Like, okay, maybe you drew seven cards. You got 14 cards in your hand. You don't have to discard. However, you only have like one or two mana left. <laughs> you know? what, how are you going to not die in this situation. I mean, if you untap with Jenga Taxis himself in play, that's kind of good enough. You know, if you can then play a Planeswalker or some other relatively thick card in terms of mana cost, drawing cards is great. If this replaces itself and draws even one card, then I would say a five mana, five, five war two that draws a card is okay. But what was the Sphinx that we got? The Domain Sphinx like two sets ago? It has flying. This doesn't have flying. It's flying in Ward 2. Draws a bunch of cards when it hits for combat damage. It's like that's... Like that didn't see any play, you know? And it's, it's got Ward and stuff. Like I don't think the Ward is going to keep this from dying. It's just going to keep your opponents from only paying two mana to kill it. They're going to pay four mana to kill it instead, which is still less mana than you spent on it. And they'll probably hit it the moment you try to transform it. So good job spending nine mana to get blown out by four mana. It's, it's, it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen every single time. Um, there's also going to be times, though, where you do get to transform and draw a bunch of cards. And then your opponent blows up the synthesis. That sucks. You have to discard down to seven, but hey, that should still be, you drew seven cards. <laughs> if at any time you're able to transform this cleanly and get seven cards off of it, I think it probably did all right. But there's even more text. I'll give you this. <laughs> if you're impressed by this card, I can see why. I mean, look at all the text on the card. If you can ever get it transformed, not only is it going to draw you seven freaking cards, and then it's going to evacuation, you know what I mean? Like It's, it's going to bounce pretty much everything to owner's hands, uh, which is a good, it's a good mode. And then you're gonna just gonna get all the cast all your spells for free. I want to draw a bunch of cards. Uh, you want to draw a bunch of cards. <laughs> so I could see this being uh, at least worth playing in standard. Again, maybe in those like Grixis mid range decks, but do even they want a card that costs this much to play? And it's double blue. That's their sort of you know the color they play the least sources of. So. I don't know, man. <laughs> I just think for five mana, there's probably better options in standard for your mid-range deck. Like, are you playing this? Are you playing Teferi in the five-drop slot? I think it's actually kind of a much tougher decision than it sounds because I think people see new things and like, I'm playing Jenga Taxi. It's Teferi's bad. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't actually know about that in practice. And so we'll have to see about this. I'm just not quite as impressed as a lot of people. But yes, those are a lot of modes. Yes, the card does ridiculous stuff, but you got to get it to actually do the thing. And it doesn't matter how like nice the Lamborghini is if you can't turn it over. But now to vindicate some of the folks in the audience, I will talk about a legendary creature that I do think is like worth all of the hype. I think that the people freaking out about this card are probably right to do so. I have no notes in terms of criticism about Omnath, Locus of All. That's right. That's right. They did it, everybody. We knew it was going to happen eventually. This is a five-color Omnath. It's a white, a blue, a Phyrexian black, a red, and a green to play this card. It's a 4-4 legendary Phyrexian elemental. If you would lose unspent mana, that mana becomes black instead. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card if it has three or more colored mana symbols in its mana cost. If you do, add three mana in any combination of its colors, put it in your hand. If you don't reveal it, put it in your hand. Now, let me translate a couple things on this card for you in case you need it. And even if you don't think you do, there might be some things on this card you didn't realize because that happened to me, but, but I'm dumb. <laughs> it's, those things happen to me from time to time, but still that first ability, this is important. Yes, it does allow you to just bank mana. If you've got untapped lands at the end of your opponent's turn, 
Uh, just tap them, compadre, and that'll lead to banked black mana at the beginning of your turn. And extra mana is really good, but there's some cool stuff about the second ability. At first, I read this as like, oh, you have to have a Grixis card or a Mardu card or, you know what I mean? Like three differently colored mana symbols on the card, but that's not, that's not what it says. You can actually get three of the same colored pip, you know? I can rip an Ayara or something off the top with this, and it'll give me the three black mana to play it. One way or the other, I guess, <laughs> right? With the card's ability, but still, if you pick up, you know, something that costs white, white, green, or blue, blue, black, or something like that with this card, it'll give you the mana to play that. And that's awesome, because originally I didn't read it that way. Originally I thought that you had to get, again, three different colored pips in order to actually make the card work, but you don't. But here's the good news, here's the good news. The thing about the card is, it actually just draws you an extra card every turn, like pretty much no matter what, which is something else that I, I think requires translating, especially for newer players. Even if it doesn't give you the extra mana to play the card or help you play the card or whatever, it still, you see, puts the card in your hand. So this is a four mana in most cases, a four mana four four that draws you an extra card every turn and just also throws a bunch of mana in your pool whenever you have extra mana. And all that is cheddar cheese. There's so many awesome things about this card, but there is a little bit of balance to it too, you know? Like there's a black Phyrexian mana in the cost. So you might be considering, oh, I can just play this in a deck that's every color except for black. I don't actually have to have black cards or black mana in my deck in order to play this card. No, you don't. But it does specifically make black mana from the banked mana, so it really would help if you had some black cards in your deck for that black mana to actually help cast. Now, you don't have to have black cards. This can cast stuff like Portal to Phyrexia or Cityscape Leveler and like other huge cards like that. You just funnel the black mana into essentially generic or colorless mana. That's nice, but still the card will incentivize you playing some black cards in your deck in order to use that black mana. So I get a little tension, a little push-pull between the fact that you don't actually have to cast the card with black mana, but you still kind of want some black cards in your deck, and I like that balance too. So really cool card here in terms of like it's finally the five mana, the five different color, you know, Omnath. I guess where do we go from here? Is this the peak, the pinnacle of magic? What, what do you do after this? Uh, anyway, uh, this card's good. This card's very good. I think it's the best card we've looked at so far. And really, it's the best card we'll look at for a few more entries here because now we're getting into the really fan servicey stuff. The kind of stuff that if you're in the wrong mood when you see it, you're going to think it's gross. You're going to think Wizards is just really leaning way too far into the, oh, people like legendary creatures. You know what else people like? Mashups. You know what we are? The Avengers. Let's do this. You're gonna, if you're in the wrong mood, I think you'll take this wrong. But then maybe later in the day, when, you, when you're just feeling better, you look at cards like this and you're like, actually, I like this idea. Um, yeah, that's a personal anecdote. That's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> anyway, let's look at some mashups, everybody. That's right. We're going to get legendary creature mashups from like each of the planes that the Phyrexians are going to. They're going to give us one card that depicts two legendary creatures sort of defending that plane on it. And some of these are incredible. Like we got Yargle and Multani today. Uh, that's the name of the card, Yargle and Multani. And it is six mana, uh, three, two black and a green for an 18-6 legendary creature. Uh, it's a frog spirit elemental. So you're going to get some great creature types off of some of these mashups. But yeah, it's a six mana 18-6. And it is also Yargle and Multani together on the same card. <laughs> like, I love it. Like, I got to say, when I first saw these today, I was kind of like, I don't know. But then maybe just my my puss unsoured at some point because I was being a bit of a sour puss for whatever reason. And looking at these now, I'm just like, all right, that this is pure joy. Why not do this? Why not? I guess. I mean, I know that it's probably the result of a, a bunch of focus groups, market testing suits in a boardroom somewhere going, you know what people like? legendary creatures let's do some stuff like this legendary creatures people love it they'll eat it up they'll buy anything and like i know it's the result of that but i still am going to allow myself to like this because you should enjoy things in life take it easy you know what i mean but still yargle is a sweet card yargle and multani is a sweet card and it's a great flavor text I, this this joke actually wears thin it's the opposite of how i view the concept of the card in general 
where it kind of grew on me over time today and yesterday. But the flavor text is like the fifth time I've read it. And I'm like, okay, it's not as funny anymore. But it is funny the first time you read it. So let's move on to Drana and Linvala here. What a cool team to put together, right? Like, especially when you get this creature type out of it. This is four mana, one, two white, and a black. So by the way, triggers Omnath, just letting you know. But yeah, it's a three, four legendary vampire angel with flying and vigilance. Activated abilities of creatures your opponents control can't be activated. Drana and Linvala, however, has all activated abilities of all creatures your opponents control. You may spend mana as though or mana of any color to activate them abilities. For the most part, this is just going to copy like dork abilities in standard, like <laughs> tapping for mana. It does have vigilance and that's a neat I see what you're doing there. It can attack and then also use activated abilities that tap. That's great, but I, I'm i not sure how much the card's really going to come up in standard, to be honest, or even on the commander table where it's probably a little bit better, but you still can't really count on your opponents having awesome activated ability creatures. You just Not every game is going to be that way. And then again, you're just kind of stuck with like a decently statted flyer, but not even really four mana, three, four. And not very good. So, you know, I'd say that you're really putting a lot of control in the hands of what your opponent's doing. And I hate cards like that, but I do love the team up here. I love me a little Orzov action too. So, so cool team up. That's kind of where it ends. And here's another one a lot like that, but this one made me pop pretty hard. This is Galta and Maverin, everybody defending Ixalan together. Let's dude, come on. This is seven mana though. <laughs> Three, two green and two white for a 12, 12 legendary Wait for it, dude. Listen to these creature types. Dinosaur Vampire. Let's go. With Trample. Whenever you attack, choose one of these things. Either create a tapped and attacking XX green dinosaur creature token with Tramps, where X is the greatest power among other attacking creatures. Or create X11 white vampire creature tokens with lifelink, where X is the number of other attacking creatures. Serious Timmy bait, but they got me. They baited me, and I'm going to have it. I'm just going to have a copy of this. That's the thing is a lot of these cards I can't wait to own a copy of for 25 cents. And I think it's probably going to be <laughs> one of those along with some of the other cards we've already seen today. But how can you not want the card in your collection, even if you never play with it? You never use this as your commander, you never whatever. Although I imagine it might be a pretty sweet commander, right? It's Lesnia. You either have a huge team of dudes and Maverin's ability is good. Or you got a huge guy and, <laughs> you know, you've gone tall instead. And so Galta's part of the ability is really sweet. So... The card is just awesome. It's just so awesome. I kind of don't even care what the text box says. The card is just awesome. Now, if you're like me and you're going through these like, okay, these are cute, but where's the good one? It's it's kind of like the best creature pair it could have possibly been. Let's look at Thalia and the Gitrog monster. This is four mana, one in Abzan colors, white, black, green for a 4-4 four, four legendary human frog horror with first strike and death touch. Great combo of abilities. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. Creatures and non-basic lands your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. Whenever Thalia and the Gitrog monster attacks, sacrifice a creature or land, then draw a card. Yeah, it kind of felt like I was going to keep reading there because that it, card does four things. The car, This card does four things and like very disparate things, you know, like the, this, this card has effects on like so many different sort of axes of the board state, the game state. Um, it's just always doing something, you know, like your opponent's trying to play lands or creatures and it's, it's they're tapping them down. And stuff. You're playing extra lands, you're drawing cards like, geez, dude, it only costs four mana. Like I've already said this on Twitter, but I want to reiterate here. I think it's important that like right now in standard, Shieldred costs four mana. It's a black card. Wandering Emperor costs four mana. It's a white card. So like if you're going to make an Abzan card, that's four mana. It has to just bang like it has to bang hard and, and know how to do it well. Right. And this card, I think, basically hits that baseline and maybe even goes a little bit above that hurdle. Right. Like it has to be better than freaking Shieldred or Wandering Emperor, or at least enough good enough to occupy, you know, that that four slot with them in your deck. And I think this is right there, man. I think this is pretty much exactly where you want to be. Um, and I've talked about Abzan Legends before, right? I mean, you have not only the aforementioned Shieldred in that deck, but at the three-drop slot, you have Glissa, you have Thalia in the two-drop slot, uh, you have Malira in the two-drop slot, and Skrelf in the one-drop slot to protect all these legends, including Thalia and Gitrog. So just deck looks stacked to me, you know? So And you've got the right lands to make it in standard. Just looks fantastic. And this is a great four-drop to add to a deck like that. It just does 
so many things that it's almost impossible not to picture the card seeing some amount of play. But we got one more new card from this set to talk about that's standard legal. I have to really choose my language carefully here. You'll see why in a second. But yeah, let's look at Chandra real quick. It's it's a pretty good looking card, honestly. But yeah, Chandra, or as they kept saying on stream, Chandra, which I never, I didn't know that's how you're supposed to say your name. That sounds silly. But Chandra, Hope's Beacon, is six mana up, four and two red for a five loyalty planeswalker. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, copy it. <laughs> you may choose new targets for the copy. This ability triggers only once each turn, cowboy. You can plus two Chandra to add two mana in any combination of colors. You can plus one Chandra to exile the top five cards of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from among the exiled cards, and you can minus X Chandra to have Chandra deal X damage to each of up to two targets. I really, really like this card. I think it does some cool stuff. Obviously, just copying like removal spells is sweet enough, but copying like a burn down the house and being able to like hit everything and then make three guys, that's pretty cool. That's okay, you know? Just being able to minus X it. I haven't really heard anybody talk about the minus X ability, but just being able to take out like two things, panic button style, take out those two guys for six mana is sometimes going to be worth playing the card or just like playing her and immediately taking out those two like two toughness guys and leaving behind a planeswalker that's going to be like massively important in some laid board states against aggro so i think the card is actually really sweet um it does something the turn it comes into play if you immediately minus exit but there's going to be other times where you immediately plus it and it goes up to seven loyalty and you immediately throw down you know reckoner bankbuster or you know, lightning strike or some two mana creature to protect it or something. So those are going to be good times. But I think a lot of the time, if you pay six mana for it, you're going to immediately plus one it. Now it still goes up to six loyalty, which is a buttload of loyalty. That's a ridiculous amount of loyalty, which is good. You paid six mana for it, but it goes up to six and you get guaranteed value. Even if your opponent can swing into it or kill it with a removal spell somehow or whatever, you still get till the end of your next turn to play one of those cards. And five cards is a pretty big dig. It sucks that it can only play instants and sorceries, but like that's still going to be fine like nine times out of ten. Like you can play an Invoke Despair off of this thing, you know? I don't mean to give you any ideas with Invoke Despair. I'd really rather not play it against that card anymore. But either way, that's a cool little ability, obviously. So I know Six mana is a lot, but I think that there's a shot with this Chandra here. But hold on now, there is one more card to look at today, but it's not from March of the Machines. It's from March of the Machines Aftermath. You see, this is going to be a 50 card small set that comes out in the middle of summer, which is exactly what I predicted would happen in our, honestly, oddly enough, in our wildest MTG theories video, the one where I wear an actual tinfoil hat for like half the video and then decide it's too loud and crinkly, so I take it off. In that video, the very first theory was that they should do a small summer set to cover for the fact that it's like five months in between standard sets over the summer, right? We should do something about that. And you don't have to release a whole set, just release a small set. That's exactly 100% the thing that they're doing. So we we called it, ladies and gentlemen, over here. Just remember that for until the end of time, but one way or the other. We're getting this set this summer sometime, and it's only going to be, again, 50 cards. A relatively small set, and spoiler season for that set is only going to be like two days, right? So they decided to go ahead and let us see one card from this tiny little bitty set, and it turns out they were trying to find the card that spoils the least from the set, and it really says a lot that the card they came up with was the Kenrith Royal Funeral, <laughs> So let's take a look at this. This is four mana, two, a white, and a black for a legendary enchantment. When it ETBs, exile up to two legendary creature cards from your graveyard. You draw X cards and lose X life, where X is the greatest mana value among cards exiled this way. Legendary spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card exiled with Kenris Royal Funeral. So honestly, I don't like the card that much, even though I'm kind of an Orzov head. You know, I've... I will make excuses for Orzhov cards, but I find that today we've seen two kind of meh Orzhov four drops, and this is one of them. I mean, you can just do this with Bard class, but maybe you'd rather do it with this right, perhaps? Maybe Kethis and Historic would rather have this card, but I think, again, there's just better ways to use this slot than spending four mana on a card that might kill you when you cast it. But if it doesn't, 
If it doesn't, you might draw four cards or something that's great. And then all those things that you drew will cost less to cast, like two less to cast because you're going to draw almost exclusively into Legends. You could make an argument the card is good, but I just don't think this is what the Legends deck needs to be doing on turn four. I think it needs to be winning the game uh, turn four or five. So, But I guess if you drop this on four, it's possible to just flood the board with garbage on five. But this doesn't help you cast your Jota. I guess that's a thing. But... What, one way or the other. It's, I'm really getting ahead of myself with this. I just think the card is a little bit clunky. Costs a whole lot of mana. Doesn't actually affect the board state the turn it comes into play either. So just costs you a bunch of life, um, which is the least crappy thing about the card. I don't want to get too far down on the life loss, but I do want to point out that, you know, if you're on the draw against Mono Red, are you really going to pay like three life to this card? And I don't know, but... One way or the other. Um, the, card, the card's a bit of a clunker, but in terms of like flavor... Oh no, the Kenrits died, I don't know. But I guess that's what happens when the Phyrexians take over every single plane, so it's not that much of a spoiler when you think about it. Anyway, I gotta get out of here, I do. I gotta get this video out before midnight, despite the little jingle at the beginning of the video. Um, probably not gonna happen. But anyway, I love you guys, <laughs> and I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place, thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love, and be kind.